The task to come up with a proper replacement for the iconic World War II Jeep was given to Ford Motor Company in 1951. Ford had quite a bit of experience building these things. The GPW was basically a Jeep stamped out by Ford in ridiculous numbers. The program would be the Military Utility Tactical Truck. And therefore, because of the habit of making acronyms out of things, the vehicle would be known as the Ford Mutt. Not to be confused with General Dynamic Land System's current offering of the Multi-Utility Tactical Transport, which is basically, as near as I can tell, an 8x8 version of the Mechanical Mule. Anyway, regardless, we are still at Rock Island, and they have a number of these vehicles which are going on the auction block in a couple of weeks in May. Although the World War II Jeep and the post-war descendant, the M38, were considered to be go-anywhere, do-anything vehicles, there was considered to be some room for improvement. As a result, a number of different design philosophies were tried. The final winner was going to be a unibody design, so gone is the chassis frame, and it has independent suspension instead of the straight axle as found on the earlier two vehicles. It still retained the title quarter-ton truck, but the highway capacity was actually 1,200 pounds, and the off-road capacity, 800. The designation ended up being the M151. And the first thing that you're going to look at to figure out are you looking at a Ford Mutt or are you looking at a Jeep is the grille at the front. Now, of course, the stamped metal bars on the Jeep are pretty much iconic to the vehicle, but they were originally developed by Ford. If you look at the Bantams and the Willis, first of all, uh, they had bars, not the stamped metal. So when they wanted to come up with the, the grille design for the M151, well, by keeping the stamped metal, they figured this is a reminder to everybody that Ford came up with this design, and by rotating it 90 degrees, they differentiated it from the Jeep, and uh, the, the, the grille had basically been associated with that manufacturer. This vehicle is actually one of the prototypes. It is an XM151, fairly rare, and it does have a couple of fairly unique features. This is the only pre-A2 that they have available right now, so this is also going to be where we're going to demonstrate a couple of the A1 features as well. So, for example, one of your first giveaways that you're looking at an earlier version is that the marker lights are actually part of the grille itself, later to be moved outwards. Other features on the early vehicle, the brush guards would eventually become dispensed with and the blackout light on the left side would be replaced on the A1 by indicators on the sides. Then of course you get to open up the hood, simple Jeep type latches, and you get to see underneath the motive power, which is either by Ford or Continental, but if you look at the actual builder's plate on the, on the side of the engine, all it says is model M151. It's a four-cylinder inline, puts out about 71 horsepower at 4,000 RPM, water-cooled, you got nine quarts of coolant up front, engine oil capacity, four quarts. And this engine actually looks to be in pretty good condition. Indeed, if you were to pull out the dipstick, you see some extremely clean oil. However, one thing the S engine is missing is the air filter system, which would be a big black thing comes out here, goes into the car, but I guess I'll open up the hood of another A2 and uh, I'll show you that instead. While I'm here, I will also point out the air conditioning system, such as it is. Open up these hatches. As the car drives forward, it shoves air down into the crew compartment. Well, simple. Suspension, as you can see, is fully independent with coil springs, so vastly different from the earlier Jeeps. Within the coils, you can find your double-acting shock absorbers. The wheels themselves are on 16-inch rims. The front tires are inflated to 20 psi, the back to 25, although you deflate them to 20 for off-road work. You could find Jeeps that had, correction, mutts that had higher PSI. So the MA25, the, the recoilless rifle version, had 40 PSI, was the designated road pressure. Originally, the wheels were made of magnesium, nice and light, and probably expensive and also tended to burn well. 
So after a short period, they were replaced by steel wheels such as this one with lightning holes cut into them. Moving along the side of the vehicle, you'll note obviously that this has come equipped with the hard cover top. The hard cover is detachable. It was available for any of the M151 series, although perhaps not all that commonly found. Going past the ordnance bomb to show just who's testing it, fuel tank filler is on the right side on this prototype, but you'll see on the service vehicles it actually gets moved to the left. Behind the door, which you'll see has the sliding system for regulating the door glass. Now under the passenger seat is where you would look for the batteries, although well, this seat has probably had better days. The data plate is positioned on this vehicle, on the prototype, on the front right of the dash. The first place you would ordinarily look for a data plate is the front of the right rear wheel fender. Uh, the other place you might look is uh, on the driver's side dash. Coming around to the back of the vehicle, no great surprises. The spare wheel is mounted in the traditional Jeep-like location. Same with the jerry can. Towing pendle with the receptacle for the electrics for the trailer. Nice solid window for looking out and keeping the heat inside. And of course, your final distinguishing mark of a very early M151 are your stoplights. Again, the A1, you start putting indicator systems into the vehicle, not so here. Step up over the arch. It's really not that bad. No power steering again, so a huge steering wheel. Uh, an interesting thing I note here is that to start it, once you have the ignition to on, which is this, of course, big lever here, on this particular variant of the vehicle, the starter pedal is actually underneath the clutch pedal. So you push down the clutch to change gear, as, as if you were going to change gear. You actually push beyond the, the starter pedal is basically the stop for the clutch. So a little extra force and your starter is engaged. I can only imagine that it was moved in the subsequent vehicles because people kept trying to engage the starter when they're changing gears. Uh, otherwise, the other two pedals are fairly normal. Now, you'll see that these are solid metal pedals and they change these in the later vehicles. The dash is actually very simple. Your traditional light switch, which hasn't changed since the year dot. Uh, all of three dials, uh, oil pressure, your speed, and your temperature. Not even rev counter. You're on your own for the revs. Front axle engage, disengage, a handbrake, and your gear shift lever. There would be the system for the windshield wipers. The windshield will hinge forward. Uh, it is a vacuum system on these earlier windshield wipers. Other than that, this is a simple runaround. You're, you're looking at basically an engine, a steering wheel, two front seats, a bench seat at the back, which is actually a little bit narrow. It's only good for two people because you've got to leave room for the wheel arches. And that's it. The M151 was accepted for service 1960 and production started. By 1964, production had changed slightly to the M151A1. And it had a couple of minor tweaks, really. Um, I, in addition to the earlier mentioned light changes, you have new generators for the new electrical requirements. The steering has changed slightly, so you've gone from a 17.9 foot turning radius to about 18 and a half. Um, most importantly, though, is that the suspension got beefed up. The, the official rated capacities were the same. It just meant that you were less likely to break down. Not the most elegant vehicle exit, but it works. There's still room for improvement, however. Certainly, the vehicle was capable of doing pretty much anything that was asked of it. The M151A1D was quite possibly the most lethal 4x4 ever made for two reasons. Firstly, it had nuclear weapons. Secondly, like all the other M151s, it had a very nasty habit of rolling over and killing the occupants. Case in point, 1967, over 3,500 accidents were recorded with M151s. 36% of them were single vehicle rollovers. These accidents were fatal. Every week you were losing two soldiers dead and 37 injured. This thing was proving more dangerous than the Russians. And even by the cavalier attitudes of the time, this was not deemed acceptable. So solutions were sought. 
One option was the rollover protection system, which is basically just a roll bar. One solution was not to enforce helmet wear. They looked elsewhere. They concluded that there were two additional major mechanical problems, the first of which was a non-directional tread tire. This is designed to be as grippy as possible off-road, and you can see why, but it's also pretty useless on the road. Now, what the M151 is, basically it was designed to be an off-road vehicle. The operators of the vehicle treated it though because, hey look, it's got a steering wheel, four wheels, a gear shift, it's a car. And that's how they drove it. Doesn't work that way. It is not an on-road vehicle. So there was a driver training program that was instituted to stop the rollovers. The other problem though was far more mechanical and that was related to the rear suspension. The swing axles were basically just a sharp nudge away from oversteer, overcorrection, and then over the top. The solution as implemented was a semi-trailing axle. Uh, the point of support, shall we say, was a little bit further forward. Wasn't the only change. I've already mentioned that the marker lights move out because we now have indicator mounts on the side. There are changes under the hood as well. The big one is that the fuel pump has been changed from electrical to mechanical. You'll also see that there are no longer any vacuum tubes going up to the windshield wipers. They have been replaced by an electric motor system. And of course you can see that air filter I mentioned earlier. Coming around the side past the reasonably sized wing mirrors, the fuel filler port as mentioned has been moved to the left hand side. Data plate in this one is front and left. It's your traditional light control again since the year dot added feature is an indicator lever so you may indicate uh, if you choose to do so and again this this lever hasn't changed you'll see it in the Humvees slightly smaller steering wheel with the horn front and center to adjust your seating position it is this very simple mechanism of you lift it out of one notch and you push it back into the next notch you'll also see that the pedals have become sort of hollow and teethed because after all, you've just got into your Jeep and your feet are coated with mud and they're slippy and they need all the grip that they can get. So the mud kind of squishes out through the pedal and the teeth grip your boot. It's actually a fairly clever idea. Although I have to say I'm a little bit surprised by the accelerator pedal, which is not grippy at all and is just basically a, a U-shape. Little wing mirror up top again, the windows will hinge and well that's basically your A2. Being the rather capable little vehicle that it was, it's perhaps no surprise that a large number of variants were built. For example, there was an ambulance version which had a longer body on the same wheelbase chassis. Anti-tank versions for a cordless rifle I mentioned earlier. There's a tow missile launcher variant. There was a variant that carried tow missiles for the tow missile launcher. There was even a fast attack vehicle variant. Although designed by Ford, a large number were actually made by AM General, and even Willis Kaiser Jeep built a few. With over 100,000 made at a price at the time of about $2,500, it's perhaps no surprise that a large number of these M151s are out available for sale. However, the DOD had declared that this vehicle was too unsafe for civilian use, so when they decommissioned them, they chopped the bodies in half and then they chopped them in quarters. However, being the enterprising folks that they are, the people in the vehicle restoration community simply welded the bodies back together again. Hey. Now that said, any mutt enthusiast who drives their vehicle routinely knows about the propensity for rollovers. So they tend to be rather careful about them on the rare occasions that they're driving anything like highway speeds. There is one little caveat I'm going to mention here. You may have noticed, as I'm standing here talking, that this vehicle isn't like the other M151A2s because you've got leaf springs and a solid axle. This is the rather rare M151A2LC. And this was an attempt of solving the rollover issues by basically using a, a CJ Jeep axle and a new transmission and clutch to go with it. Obviously, never entered service. In fact, as far as I know, this is the only one that still exists. Anyway, hope you found it interesting and informative. I'll see you on the next one. Uh, so eventually they were replaced by presumably also cheaper steel wheels such as this one with lightning holes cut into them. And what happened there? 
<sighs> okay. So let's try this again, this time with the record button pressed. Not to be confused with General Dynamic Land System's current offering of a MUT, which is the multi-utility tactical transport. The program was called the Military Utility. Multi -utility. Film is cheap. Not to be confused by General Dynamic Land System's current offering of a MUT, the Multi-Utility Tactical Transport, which is basically an 8x8 version of the Mechanical Mule. Yay. Now what? <laughs>